Magic is just like music. If you don't like rock, doesn't mean you don't like country. There's all different genres. And it's the same thing with magic. There's tons and tons of different kinds of magic. Store front in Poland, the church, the library, the Grange, all the restaurants, all have a magician in there. And they're all doing different kinds of magic. We have gospel magic, we have close-up magic, we have bar magic, we have kids magic, we have birthday magic, all the different kinds of magic. You can't live in the magic capital of the world without seeing some just phenomenal magic. Uh, when I started doing magic, rainbows were still in black and white. Everybody knows how to do magic. I got hooked, it's, it's a bug. You get those kind of reactions from people, you get to see how, how happy the, the, the magic can make them. You just wanna keep doing it. So magic is the second oldest profession in the world. Understand, magic is self-gratifying. If I show you a trick, if I learn a trick and I show it to you and I put a smile on your face, that's gratifying to me. So it raises my self-esteem. And so kids like that, they like to get that confidence. They like that attention. And so I think that's why kids still like magic, probably more now than ever. Magic can take your entire reality and make you question that for a moment. And if you reinforce that with a message of empowerment or something that's reinforcing, or maybe something that's a little spooky, you can get a great emotional reaction from people and send them on their own artistic journey. And that's not a bad message. We as people tend to see and believe things without really knowing why. So they took a stab at magic, which was a magic shop, the only one here in town. I got to meet my first magician. I fell in love with magic that weekend. And I remember telling my folks on the way home, someday I'm gonna be a real magician and someday I'm gonna live in Colon. And I can remember that as sure as I'm sitting here, that's exactly what I wanted to do. And that was always my goal since I was a kid. Um, never was a resident here from Muncie, Indiana originally, but Colon was always in my heart, my second home. Uh, the, the more popular story is that they opened up a dictionary to a random page, put their finger on it, and that's the one they chose. The real story, the secret though, is that the name of this village was selected through a process of elimination. A man by the name of Harry Bhutan, uh, you would have known him under the name of Harry Blackstone, but came to Colon after his wife talked about it. Sure enough, it was ideal. The one that discovered Colon, so we credit her and Harry as uh, very important in making Colon the magic capital of the world. The Blackstone House, this is where uh, Harry lived for many years with his wife, Inez. And uh, this Inez is the one that actually found this plot of land in, in 1926. This is where they moved the entire troop. So if you can picture this and in, use your imagination a little bit, the entire staff would be down here, the barn on the, on the hill, uh, working on refurbishing props, getting ready for the upcoming season. They, there's really a grill on the other side over here made out of stone and they would that's where they would fix the dinners and they would have big dinners every night and it was like a little commune down here. Uh, this is where they uh, for 20 some years this is where they stayed and this is where they uh, called home. Harry Blackstone met an old friend of his, Percy Abbott. Percy Abbott was from Australia. Harry Blackstone and Percy Abbott got to talking and came up with the idea of starting a magic company. That only lasted 18 months. Uh, Blackstone was on the road in the vaudeville era, making a lot of money. He was a rival of Houdini's. And Percy stayed here in Colon, and uh, he was manning the Blackstone magic store. Well, when Blackstone came in off the road, uh, Percy said there wasn't any money, but Percy was driving a new car, and he had a new wife and a new house. And so he and Blackstone had a fight. And you know, the, the particulars are kind of lost in antiquity. Well, uh, my dad was down on the farm. Percy was performing in a tent show, and he came to their small town, and uh, he was gonna be there for the whole week. And so my dad uh, bought lessons from Percy, and then uh, the show closed early, and so to get the rest of his lessons that he had paid for, he had to come to Colon, and Percy saw an investor, and uh, away they went. 
we're in Abbott's Magic. Abbott's Magic is the oldest magic store in Colon. Our business was established in January of 1934. The I... most controversial magic thing that I would say that's happened in relation to Abbott's would have to have been uh, at the uh, 19... I'm not sure what year it was, but it was a uh, at one of the get-togethers held at Sturgis Young Auditorium. Uh, there was a magician from South America, Chami Khan, and he performed the crucifixion. And it wasn't a trick. Percy Abbott actually did nail nails through the guy's hands and raised the cross up. Uh, they escorted the women and children out before they did it. But uh, there was a real crucifixion done on stage at one of the Abbott's magic get-togethers. My favorite magician uh, was a gentleman that lived here in town. He worked for Abbott's for years. His name was Neil Foster. Neil Foster perfected the floating silver ball called the zombie. And I used to make the trek to Colon every year just to see him. I didn't care if Houdini was on stage. I wanted to see Neil perform. They used to call him Flawless Foster. Everything he did was perfection. And that was, in my mind, and still is, he is the, the ultimate magician. And besides him, maybe Harry Blackstone Jr. But uh, Neil Foster was my idol growing up. Magic, like almost everything else, has ups and downs, ups and downs. The talkies came, vaudeville pretty much died. Uh, magicians were reduced to doing short little magic shows in front of a movie screen before the movie. Uh, and then it went up again. Uh, in the 70s, magic was in a, in a lull. And a guy came, named Doug Henning came along. He was a magician hippie if you will. We have a lot of his paraphernalia here at the Magic Museum of Magic. And he renovated magic all over again. Then David Copperfield came along. He did like 18 specials on TV. Uh, it made him a billionaire. And, and he is in the Guinness Book of World Records today for doing more shows than anybody else in history, including Michael Jackson. Right now, I think we are in one of the high spots. We've got Penn & Teller on TV all the time. We've got David Blaine. We've got uh, Chris Angel. Lots and lots of magicians have made a really big splash. Uh, I think we're in a high spot, and I think hopefully we're gonna stay there for a while. Unfortunately, the distribution of the internet has also allowed bigger ideas about, well, do you use this to communicate? Yeah, having fun with it is good, but you can teach with this. You can make people feel better about everything. Maybe the world is on fire, but you are not. Start with the library, and that can be the internet now, but there's uh, all sorts of free information out there. And if you find that this is something you like, find someone local, find a teacher. Uh, one of the things that is true in any art, particularly magic, is when you are ready, the teacher will appear. Someone will be there to show you the path on the next step. Uh, I guess when they had the mass magician on and he was exposing tricks, uh, that, that upset a lot of magicians and a lot of people. It's, it's really much more fun to just be uh, entertained. Uh, the how-to is if you're a small boy and maybe you're going to grow up to be an engineer and you concentrate on just how does this thing work. Uh, but the mass magician, uh, he's come and gone. I guess he's probably still on the internet, but uh, that he was quite controversial at his time, yes. Afterwards, um, a little boy and his aunt came up. You know, so I spent some time and talked to him. His aunt gave me a, uh, a dollar bill or 10 or whatever. It was a dollar. It was folded up like a little bow tie. He's like, oh, here. And I'm like, oh, no, I can't take that. And she said, no, take it and, and, and read it later. Okay. So I packed it up, said thank you. And so uh, later that evening, I opened it up. His aunt wrote the past couple years have been it, and I still keep it to this day in my wallet. The uh, past couple years have been really rough. He lost both of his parents. She expressed how grateful that, um, you know, she was when we took the time with uh, her, her nephew 
and that um, he so enjoyed our show the first time we were around and was so glad that we took him backstage that that just meant the world. And that was one of the first times she'd seen him smile. You know, to me, it was like I realized why it is that we do what we do here. And um, once again, you never know whose life you may impact that day. And just like when they talk about kindness, you never know whose lives you're gonna touch. You know, it may be someone that's going through hell and that time you just spent entertaining them, putting a smile on their face that um, you just, you never know. We're both huge fans of the movie, The Greatest Showman. I really feel like that, to a certain extent, describes our lives perfectly. Whatever you do, wherever you go, I don't care. I just want to be part of it and be with you. And that's that's kind of how I've always viewed it as. I've never been, a lot of magic wives are, oh, it's a stupid little magic hobby. I have never felt that way. This is what you do, I love it too. This is our life. It's not your life and my life. This is our life together. This is something that we've built together. Yes, I helped paint these walls. Yes, I helped hang dry wall. I've helped plaster. I helped build this stage. I've helped paint this. I've helped him hang lights. It's something that we have done together and built together. And even when it's difficult at times, it's still to be able to stand back and go, wow, we built this together. And if you saw pictures before of what it looked like, I mean, we had razor blades scraping paint off of the windows because there was like all these flowers. This was a flower shop at one time. So there was all these flowers painted on the uh, front of the windows. And there were weekends he and I came down and I I had gloves on because I didn't want to ruin my nails scraping off the paint with lacquer thinner. But that's what you do when you have a dream and you're, you're working with your spouse to build a dream. You, you get in the trenches and you do that with them. And I've never regretted it.